Hello and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2 for this week's summary of what went on in last week's stream and how things have been going and today we're going to be taking a bit of a look at how our Naquitite extraction is going and you'll notice that the belts here have all stopped so that's kind of, it's either a very good sign or a very bad sign, we'll get into that later. And we're also going to take a bit of a look into the into the Vulcanite extraction and a few things that have been going on back on the homeworld. So, let's get stuck in. The first place we're going to take a look at is the asteroid field of Melancholia. And Mike has been out here getting sad, I mean get building things up and getting everything up and running and he's got to what he calls a proof of concept. And by that he means he's got pretty much everything running on a small scale and it just needs to be expanded. So over here you can see we've got power generation, we've got a beam receiver firing in and now, he's managed to, and now we've got enough space pipes out here. He's been able to finish off the power system so this is all running nicely now. He's got 3 gigawatts of power available, this should all be absolutely fine. He's got his sulfuric acid production going on over here, and there's a nice steady stream of um, all of the inputs, in theory at least, there's a nice steady stream of all the inputs coming in via this Arcolink storage over here, and we'll talk a bit more about that in the, in the moment. But this is bringing in, as you can see, it's bringing water in around here, the iron's coming in around here to be sliced into plates and then passed down into here. The only thing we're a bit short of is sulphur, however that's not too much of a problem because, well, there's a bit in this tank here, and he's been pumping it through from here, and all the way down to this station over here, where we have another full tank. And speaking of, there is, a, there is a setup of stations over here. Now actually these haven't quite finished building yet, however there is one that is basically complete and therefore a train can pull in here, it can unload Naquitite from a mine, that will then flow over, go into a warehouse, warehouse to warehouse, and then be passed up to here, where it can then be passed through into the Arcolink and passed over to Talos as we've been discussing before. He's also tweaked the requests a bit, so looking here, these are all the things that we're asking for over here. This is our shopping list. So we've got ice coming in, as you can see there's a nice healthy flow of it through there. The iron is healthy as well. The, the sulphur is struggling a little bit. We don't have enough of that, we're, um, as you can see by the, the empty belt. But we'll get some more of that through fairly soon. I think there's been a bit of a plundering going on because he's been making so much acid. And that gets through a lot of sulphur, as we've seen over on Stardust. He's also pulling through Meteor Defense Ammunition, which is going into the warehouse here and then being fed into the guns, and he's now upgraded to the correct number of guns, he's got a decent number of them over here. That should be enough to keep the, everything safe. And he's also bringing in charged train power packs, which are currently, actually this isn't quite finished, so the proof of concept not quite ready yet, but they're being brought over, they're put into, a, into the warehouse here. Eventually he'll run a belt from here down to the train system over here. In fact, he's, if we look, he's already got these belts in here planned, and these are the, here we've got one that's going to bring the battery packs in, where they can then be brought over and loaded into the train, and then another Another one to take the dead battery packs away, either the, and they come away in two forms, as you can see over here, we've got both the uh, the discharged ones, and these are batteries that just need to be to be recharged, so you, you pass them through a machine, the machine will recharge them. He's also watching for destroyed ones, and I don't think you actually get destroyed power packs out of a train. I believe the way it works is that you pull the discharged power pack out of the train, you then feed it over, put it into a battery pack charging station, and most of the time, the battery charging will go successfully, you'll get a new power pack out, fully charged, ready to go back into the train, but 1% of the time it gets destroyed and has to be dealt with. And dealing with a destroyed power pack is actually fairly straightforward. You just you just have to put in some new batteries and some more sulfuric acid, tops it back up again, and you get the discharged power pack back out the other side, which can then be recharged, put into the trains, and so on. So I suppose technically there is a chance that you might do that and then it immediately breaks again and you have to uh, fix it again, but that seems relatively unlikely. But hey, I guess 1% chances happen more often than you'd expect. And so this is and so this is going to allow him to have a, a charging station probably up here on this rock that's going to take in the uh, the discharge batteries, recharge them, and then put them back into the system again. And then he's going to be able to take away the destroyed ones, stick them onto probably one of these belts over here, where they'll go back into the Arcolink chest and be teleported away. And then they'll stop being his problem. So then uh, then then it'll be up to me to deal with them. He's added in a second Naquitite mine. So originally we just had this patch here, which is pulling it up very slowly. Now he's got this patch here as well, which is pulling it up slightly more quickly. It's still not exactly fast however as you've seen it is a, it has gone it has ground to a halt we've got apparently enough of it so we're um that seems to be all right that, that, and that belt there i think should be like that there we go that'll allow the flow to go a bit more uh, a bit more smoothly through there and so this is going to roughly double the rate we can get the naquitite out but that's still not going to be enough for the long term and so he's put in this rail spine along here and he started planning out a, a rail system over here so we've got a lot of a, there's a lot of stations over here um, i'm not quite sure why he's got this many in there now i know he's planning to bring the acid out separately from the uh, Naku to bring in the Nacrotite back, unlike the system I've got in Stardust, where we have a single train that fills up with Nacrotite to bring back when it's out of the mines, but also fills up with a sulfuric acid when it's here. And so the system is a bit, a little bit more self-contained, and I quite like that. However, Mike has decided that it's better to have one train taking acid out to wherever it's needed, and that's a, a slightly bigger train, so you know you can take you take a bit more each time it goes out, and then a separate trains bringing the Nacrotite back, because then if you have a bit of a shortage of acid, which is a 
a problem I had quite a lot, that means then your Naquatite drains can keep running and keep running and keep running, at least until you drain the tanks out in the um, outposts in the in the mine areas. In a way, this is potentially slightly more um, slightly more robust and will carry on running for a bit longer if you have a supply problem with the sulfuric acid. However, it does mean more trains running around, and I, I quite like the pleasing elegance of just having everything on a single train. He's also made his trains quite a bit shorter than mine. I don't think that's a serious problem. It means they're, they're only going to transport half as much Naquatite each time they run, but it means you can run them twice as often, and I don't expect that to be a problem. These trains are pretty quick, and he's got them all fully boosted as well, so they'll be going moving even faster. So I don't think he's going to have any problems with throughput here. Um, it's just a different way of looking at it. And so the big changes that are required to support these updates are basically down to bringing more stuff through the, uh, through the Arcolink storage. And so, over on Talos, I've been hard at work making sure all of that will work. So last time, we already had this system set up down here, which is bringing through water, ice, iron, and sulfur when there's any available. And as you can see, we have a, we currently have a bit of a problem with sulfur. If we look at this pylon over here, you can see that the, we've got positive numbers for everything else, which is why we've got the red lights on the, on the appropriate belts. We've got a green light on the sulfur belt, because we still have, we have a shortage of sulfur. It's asking for 50 more than we've shipped through so far, and there isn't any available because it's asked for huge quantities, and we've shipped all of that through. And that's used it all up. So we're going to have to wait for another train to come down from Tel Orbit, or possibly even another spaceship to come over all the way from Norbit with a load more sulphur on it in order to feed that into the system over here, pass it all the way through, and then and then allow it to be fed through over here and go over to be made into that sulfuric acid we're seeing. But I don't think that's a serious problem. As I said, there's quite a lot stockpiled over there, so we seem to be okay. The other thing I've added in is this belt system along here, and as you can see here, this is bringing over the charged train power packs and also meteor defense ammunition. So those can then be fed through to be sent over to Melancholia through the Arcolink chest as well. And this works in basically the same way. We're also monitoring the signals from, that's being sent over from Melancholia here, so whenever we see less than zero uh, train batteries, we'll ship some of those through. Whenever we see le fewer than zero Meteor Defense Ammers will ship those through and match, so that's going to work quite nicely. Now the interesting thing about this is that we have this chest here that has, well at the moment it has a quantity of each one of those in here, and the idea is that they're brought over on this belt here. But, but you say, why isn't that a solid belt? What's going on? Well over here we've got a system set up to pass those out as, as, as uh, whenever any appear in here, because I don't want to have a stockpile of them building up here, because they're, they're fairly expensive things, and filling up all of these belts and then having a stockpile down in the chest down here just seems like a bit of a waste of, well, of stuff. And so, I've set up one of the memory cell systems, much like Mark has been doing with the uh, Vita Everythings that he's transporting around. And the way that works is that we have this combinator over here working as a memory cell. So we've got the uh, the cable going right from the front of it to the back of it. So anything that's passed out, anything that comes out on the output goes immediately back to the input. And that means it will hold that number. So we've got, at the moment, any signal that's passed in will then be passed out again. And it will just keep looping around forever and will be held stable. We are then watching that signal up here in specifically, and we're saying if that ever goes below 200, then we'll turn the belt on. And if so, then we'll pa that means we'll pass through some meteor defense ammunition. It'll flow down the belt down here and go off to, uh, to places which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and if that happens, then we want to count each of those out. So each time this triggers, each time something passes through here, we will read the belt contents as a pulse. That gets fed from here directly into this combinator, and so that will increase the count. So therefore making it less likely for the, this will trigger, less likely for this to be under 200. So for example, if I set this to 300 instead of 200 for a moment, then it'll run like this, we'll pass through those, those extra 100, but as you can see, you can see the number up there climbing, and then when that gets to 300, it stops here. And that's the memory cell system working, and these then get passed down here. All of these bits on here are not aren't doing anything they're just a way of passing the signal up without using pylons then at the other end we follow it all the way down this belt this runs all the way down here to here where it will be then fed into the train using this loader here so all those all those that meteor defense ammo will come down this belt and will be fed into the train similarly down here we have an inserter which is watching for space train power packs being less than 200 and any time they're less than 200 it will then it will then activate because we've got the enable disable but also it reads the hand contents again as a pulse so if it picks up say three um, train batteries it will pulse out a, a three three train batteries onto the network and that's passed it down this red cable here which goes all the way up round here it's a rather convoluted route that it takes but eventually that gets all the way back up to here and it's also passed into this memory cell so those will be remembered as well so that means if you ever have a shortage of any of the things you're monitoring for in your memory cell system that'll, then it'll it'll put feed a bit more of it in they'll go into the logistics system they'll end up in the train that comes in here they'll be unloaded into this warehouse and then they'll be passed up here along this belt because it's filtered to pass them out along here they'll come through and they'll go into the chest over here 
Then, if we need any of them over in Melancholia, they'll be allowed through because of these, these belts here will be controlling the, uh, the rate that the stuff can flow through. And then as they go through here, they'll be counted back out. So we read belt contents as a pulse there. And that's being fed into this signal transmitter, which goes to this signal receiver up in tell orbit, which is connected to this combinator, which multiplies it by minus one. So this, this, what, this system here counts them out into the system. So it counts up to make sure that you won't feed any more in. And then when you get to the number you need, it'll, it'll, stop, it'll stop the belt. However, when they go out at the other end, it will then count down again, and so this number will be taken lower. And so as we pass more stuff through at the other end, eventually you'll, you'll start to have a shortage, and we'll start to pass them back in again here. So the idea is that you count stuff in, count it out, and you'll always have 200 in the logistics system, which is this belt, the train, the belts on the ground, and the chest at the end. So you should always have 200 of each somewhere in that system. Now, you may have noticed, if you're paying attention, that this chest does not have 200 of each of those things in. It's got 86 and 69 of them. And this means that we've had some sort of problem somewhere in the system. I've had a bit of a think about it, and I'm pretty sure what has happened is that we've had a bit, a bit of a power shortage. So this, uh, so when there's a power shortage, your trans signal transmitters and receivers will immediately completely stop working. And so that will break the system here. We don't send those negative signals through, and so we don't realise that we've taken stuff out of the system, so we don't know that we need to put stuff back in. Now, if this just happens as a one-off, it's it's annoying, you, but it's not the end of the world. You can just increase the numbers on the inserters up at the top to, to allow a bit more to flow through until it's back up to a, the number you want it to be at. Um, but if it happens regularly, then you're going to have problems. Eventually, you'll, you'll, you'll get to the point where there's nothing in the system down here, but the feeders at the top think there's 200 in there. So with a memory cell, you, especially Especially if you've got a signal transmitter in there, you need to be very, very careful about power at levels. And so if we look at the amount of power we have available, well, at the moment it seems to be absolutely fine. We're only using about how, half of the available power. But as we've seen, the Naquin processing is not running properly at the moment. If we look back over the last 10 hours or so, we can see that back here, um, one and a half hours ago, we we're pulling five gigawatts out of the flat solar panel twos. We're pulling uh, three point three out of the solar panel threes, and more. And actually, if we want to check this a bit more if effectively, we can look at the uh, holmium accumulators, and we can see that a number of times recently we've been pulling power out of the accumulators. So we need to put down more solar up here to make sure that that never happens again. If the accumulators are being used, then there is clearly insufficient power available, and they and there's not. We don't have a lot of accumulators here, so they'll discharge quite quickly, and then we will have problems and as you can see we have had those problems and so it looks like this power area over here needs to be expanded even further maybe down into this area over here probably even further out this way as well and that's going to be a bit of a problem because as you've seen we have a bit of a shortage of the uh, scaffolding and of the, of the solar panels however I'm pretty sure I can go and nick some from somewhere and may probably be able to get that up and running because uh, that does seem to be fairly important we need to we need to make sure we can keep feeding everything out to the uh, to the system at the other end that we need to down on the ground, I did notice that we now have a supply of sulphur available, so that's nice. A train must have come down with a load on it. So that's now being fed through into the Arcalink storage, along with some ice, and the ice is being used up at the... Well, it's used up proportionally to the sulphur, because whenever you make some, um, whenever you make some acid, you need ice, you need iron, you need sulphur. And so over here, you can see that the sulphur is flowing out over here. Every so often, there'll be a little burst of iron or ice coming out as well, just to keep the numbers on, uh, on track. And then that's all being fed down through here. We're making quite a lot of sulfuric acid down here, and it's being used up by this machine as quickly as it's coming in. However, this tank down here is filling up. It was on 15,000 before. It's now on 60,000, so it's call it a quarter of the way to being filled up, so I'm confident that this will be a solved problem fairly soon. The only slight issue is that every time Mike goes out to build up a new mining area, he's going to take an enormous quantity of acid out there to prime it, um, and that's going to pull through a huge amount of sulphur, but in the long run, I don't expect that to be a serious problem. He's got quite a lot buffered in the tank down here. That's easily enough to load a train up four times before, uh, before he starts to have problems there, uh, and there's going to be quite a lot buffered in the tank up here. I don't see I don't see any problems here with it with it running. I think it's going to be absolutely fine. It's just we might it, it might just be a little while until we actually have a backlog of sulfur and, and have the system completely satisfied. I also mentioned that Mike is going to be starting to throw destroyed train batteries back this way. So they're just going to be dumped into the Arcalink chest and they're going to find their way back over here. And so eventually, uh, in fact I need, to, I need to program this, this this one down here is also going to export any destroyed space train power packs. They're going to come down this belt here along with the Naquitite and then this splitter here is going to split them off. So the Naquitite is going to carry on going up here and going off to be processed as, as before but the dead train batteries can then be brought down here and they'll be shoved onto this Naquium belt down here. Now I suspect it might be better 
in the long run to use a splitter here, but once we start using Naquium up at a decent rate, that's not going to be a problem. That will then allow them to be fed along here, down here, up, up all the way around here, into the into the train system here, which will put them into the spaceship, which will eventually end up with them being dropped off here into this system. And over here we have we're watching for everything that's coming through, and so we've got various cunning filters on the systems over here. So up here we're, we're making sure the crystals and the ingots only come out on these belts up here. Great, fine. Then we are monitoring everything in this warehouse and subtracting enormous numbers of Naqu Naquium ingots, space drain power packs and Naquitite crystals from it. And that means any other junk, like in this case the uh, steel plates and anything else we ship through from here, will find their way onto these belts. They'll go into this uh, warehouse up here and they'll be taken away by a train eventually. Once there's enough in here, a train will come in, stop over here and take it away down to Norvis where it can be recycled. I mentioned the space train power packs being a massive negative number, so we're feeding those into the uh, filters down here along with the contents of this warehouse. And that means that we're only going to pass out the stuff we want to get rid of. These two filters at the top will get rid of space train power packs destroyed and scrap as well and that goes onto a different belt and this one runs up the middle here and goes onto the main disposal belts that are running up the middle of the uh, the middle of the base and so that will allow them to be passed over to the, to the recycling system over here and they'll be passed down at these belts down the middle and this has filters that will take everything out as, as appropriate and eventually the the uh, destroyed power packs will be taken out down here put into these machines which will re refurbish them and then they can be charged up and they'll go back into the system in general and be shipped off to wherever they're needed or used by whichever trains need them so we're doing quite a nice sort of recycling system around here everything it will be get brought back over here and be reused and passed back out as necessary. And so this system has been working really nicely. We've had it's been it's been a trickle of Naquitite coming through, isn't it? It's not been enough to really satisfy it when it when it's running full bore. But you know, it's a, it's a proof of concept. Mike is going to be putting in more mines, and therefore we're going to be getting a lot more Naquitite through. Everything is going to run a lot faster. However, it's all ground to a bit of a halt at the moment, as you might have noticed. So you can see over here we've got the Naquitite is not flowing, and if we look over here, we can see it's because these belts aren't flowing. If we follow them down, it's because we've got to, with the crushed Naquitite type belts aren't flowing. Going down here, la 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 la, into the warehouse down here, we've got a full warehouse of crushed Naquitite, which is kind of good, but also kind of bad, because it means the system's not flowing. Uh, and that's, and if we follow that through, well, we, we could go through all the system, but there's no point. We can see here that the, the belt is full of Naquium and full of Naquium crystal. Those are not flowing, they're not going into here, and that is because we're currently not requesting any. If we look at the signals here, you can see we have large positive numbers of both the Naquitite crystals and the Naquium ingots. And that's because over in Norvis, we have a full warehouse here of uh, Naquitite crystals. We have a full uh, warehouse of Naquium ingots here. Well, a nearly full warehouse here. Basically, we've hit the, um, the capacity where we say, actually, we don't want any more than that. This is, this is what we're going to call full. Um, and this is because we don't have any science running at the moment because we've run out of other things. But I'll talk about that in tomorrow's video. Suffice to say for now, the Naquium has all gone to sleep, which means all the spaceships have stopped flying between Kalidus and Stardust, so you can see there's none flying over here. If we look in Stardust, we will see that this system has also gone to sleep. It's completely full, everything is full, everything is just sitting there. And of course, the system over on Melancholia has gone to sleep. So at this point, we have <laughs> we actually have too much Naquium. We need to do something about that. We need to start using it again, which means there are other things we need to fix. But as I say, that's going to be another chapter. Another interesting issue we ran into was with the uh, Vulcanite. And so I built up the system ages ago and uh, reckoned it was going to be big enough and, and fast enough to keep us, keep us satisfied at least for quite a long time. And to be fair, that was true. However, that long time ended pretty much in the last stream when we discovered that actually we were running a bit short of it. Now the problem is it has now been solved because I came out here and I did some fairly simple upgrades. The first one was just by dragging an upgrade planner over the, all of the processing facilities here to upgrade all of the blue belts to purple belts. As you can see, we've now got purple belts all the way through here, ev absolutely everywhere. And to upgrade, update the, uh, the speed beacons here to, to using speed module sixes and actually also to upgrade all of the buildings to be using productivity module sixes as well. But we didn't have enough productivity modules because productivity modules are expensive and difficult. Uh, so the, uh, the upgrade has now been done. We've got the uh, these these are all upgraded to purple belts pretty much all the way through. There's been a couple of little hiccups, like down here, we, I didn't have enough purple splitters to finish this bit off. So it's not quite perfect, but it, I've hopefully essentially doubled the speed of it by, by bringing all the inputs up from being 45 items per second to 90 items per second, and the same with all the belts in the, in, in the middle and all the outputs as well. And I reckon that it was easier just to upgrade everything and not worry about the fiddly bits. And you can see over here, if we compare the speeds that things are running at, well, we've got here, this is an old system, and I've not upgraded this one because this is the one that's being fed by the core mining, and to be honest, the amount of core fragments coming through, we can deal with on the old old system. It's not it's not been worth upgrading it, at least unless I put some more core mines in. Um, however, we, if we look through here, we can see that these machines are running at a speed of 6.4, these are running at a speed of 3.6, over here we're running at 
10.9, so it's not quite double, and down here it's 5.85, so again, not quite double, but it's quite a lot faster, and upgrading to purple belts everywhere means we know that all of this is going to be fast enough. And so that's been all the belts all the way down to here, down to the um, down to the warehouses, and all the ones that are loading up the trains as well. So we've now got a lot more throughput. We can fill up, in theory at least, we can fill up the trains a lot more quickly. And you can tell that it's worked by looking at the various different inputs. So we've got the first three belts here. These are all just junk disposals. These are bringing the junk away from the core processing. So we've got loads of stone and ores and things coming in here. Those are being chucked in here. And we never want to have any sort of limit on those because those should always, always just run. Then these two are bringing in vulcanite. And we're watching the signal. If it's ever less than zero, so the subtraction going on somewhere in the system at the other end, before it's transmitted in case there's a power problem. But if we've ever got less than zero, then we want these to flow through, and that's the standard case, because this is the cheap stuff. This is the uh, vulcanite that's coming from core mining, so we always want to use that by preference. And then on these other belts, we're watching them and saying if there's ever less than minus 50,000. So if there's an actual shortage of vulcanite, then we want to feed through from these belts as well, just to get that bit more flowing through and speed the, uh, speed the processing system up. And those have stopped, because we are currently in the sort of, we're a little bit low, but we're not very low. So we, we, want, we want to bring more over, but we don't want to bring enormous amounts more, so that just means we shut down the other systems when, when we're in this state. And there we go, the train is now basically full, so we're just filling the belts up and then the train can leave. And so we've got so we've got the two supplies going on up here. We've got the uh, the one from Core Fragments and the one from Mines. And the one from Mines, well, when when I sped it up like this, I discovered that there was quite a shortage of input on all of these, uh, uh, on all of these, and so we weren't getting enough vulcanite being brought in to keep the systems flowing quickly enough. And that was down to a couple of things. The first problem was that the mines we had, they they weren't really keeping up. I mean, they, they were they were digging up the ore reasonably quickly, and it was it was coming into the warehouses over here, but it wasn't being taken away fast enough. And that was because I had the, um, the the stations over here set to monitor for a certain number of a certain quantity of the um, of, of vulcanite being available, divided by three point two thousand, which is basically a train load. And output that as an L, and that means we can then call for up to three trains uh, as the warehouse fills up. So we'll call for the number of trains that we've got enough vulcanite to fill. And this means that if the uh, when the warehouse is only partly full even if the warehouse would be full by the time another train had arrived, you won't call for another train until it gets to that point. And so there's quite a lot of time wasted in, with the trains in transit. Now, there are a number of possibilities here. One fix would be to always set the train limit to three and have enough trains that it doesn't matter if you've got three just always parked down here and they're not able to fill up because there'll be other trains will come from the other mine. So you just have, at that point, you have three for, three trains for every single mine and you reckon you reckon on them stacking up at this end even if they're waiting to, waiting for there to be enough ore to fill up. Another possibility is to make the trains run a bit faster, and that is something I want to do. If I can actually find any of the trains, okay, there's some over here. If we take a look at some of these trains, and we can say, actually, we would like to speed them up by putting in all of the um, all the boost uh, to tech in here, so the motors and the batteries and the power receivers and so on. Um, and that that's something I want to do because these trains, when they do run, run very very slowly. The other way to fix it is to put in some more mines, and I did that as well. So up here, I found another three uh, vulcanite patches. They're all fairly close together, so I've whacked in another three mines, and some sort of weirdness going on here. It looks like I've forgotten a signal. I have indeed forgotten a signal. There should be a signal there in order to allow these trains to travel through. So that's a that's a, a major a major problem there. Uh, need that that's going to need to be sorted out. Um, and then the, what, and then having these extra supplies up here means that we're just pulling the uh, the vulcanite out of the ground that bit more quickly, and there's a lot more available, and we can then feed it out and keep keep more stations happy just by having more throughput and more trains. We are going to run into the issue though, where down here on all of these stations we may not have the trains coming in because in the time it takes for the uh, for the warehouse to empty we may not end up calling for another train. So perhaps the answer to that is to always have the uh, the train numbers on here, always requesting two trains. And if we've got enough mines and enough trains, then I think that should get us to the point where we will always, in theory, have two trains trying to get to each one of these stations. And trying to get to could mean parked in the station or could mean on its way. And then always have tr always try to call three trains for these stations up here. So as soon as a train is released from one of these, it will immediately have a station to go off to and then the next train will be able to pull in. And I think that's going to be the best way to do it. If I set, if I pick, if I count up the number of mining stations I have, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and don't worry about potentially empty trains waiting in these stations when they can't fit it, fill up. Multiply that by three, so 21. If I have 21 trains doing this route, which I'm not far off, I currently have 17 of them, so I just need to make another four trains, and ideally boost them all so they go a bit faster. I think that's going to keep the system running much more nicely, even if it means some of the trains are going to be waiting a bit longer than they otherwise need to, and it's going to use more trains than the bare minimum. But I think that's going to be much better, and, and very, very worth it, and is uh, unfortunately it's going to mean that all of those clever things I set up with some of these, uh, with, with all these things watching to see what the train limits should be set to are going to be completely unnecessary 
but I'm okay with that. However, none of that actually matters at the moment because we're not using any Vulcanite from these systems. Oh, actually, I take that back. We've obviously had a, a couple of trains take it away from uh, from the systems in Norbit because suddenly the, all of these have started running again. So you can see these are all running flat out now, bringing the uh, Vulcanite through. So we've got we're pouring into this warehouse a lot more quickly, and the systems up here are all running now. And so that should mean that we'll start emptying these warehouses, and that should mean that we'll start calling trains into them. Uh, so we'll see a bit more a bit more action now. Um, the trains start to run. Okay, there's that problem up there. Am I on this planet? No, I'm over this planet. I'll just nip down there and fix that. And once I put the signal in over here, well, actually, things have started working a little bit better because this train's got a, that train got out of the way. But now we've got the signal in there, so the trains will no longer be blocked by a train in this station. They can start running through here like this, as you see. They'll find stations to go off to, and I can just go around and I can start tweaking all the uh, all the train limits on all of these stations and just have the trains more more where I want them to be and get a much more reliable flow of Vulcanite coming through. I did run into a couple of minor issues while I was doing the upgrades out here. The first one was quite silly. I didn't bring enough arithmetic combinators over with me, so I ended up needing to make them by hand. And that meant I needed to make some, I needed to get some stone bricks and some copper plates and some iron plates. So I've got these um, these little furnaces down here that I was feeding by hand, basically from the, from the stuff that's being brought in through the trash system. We have plenty of iron ore, we have plenty of copper ore, and we have plenty of stone. Uh, although you can only see two of those flowing through at the moment. I'm not quite sure what's happening with the rest of the copper and the, the, uh, the iron. It's obviously going in over here. Oh, here we go, we're taking in iron here to be made into steel to make the barrels to take the fluids away. I don't know where the copper's going, but, you know, some of it will come through eventually. So I was able to grab some of that and, 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 and make the metals. <laughs> it felt a bit silly, though. And the other one was with the uh, the way that robots work in Factorio. So I had a, um, a massive upgrade planner over all of this. So all of this was set to be upgraded, but Factorio can only cope with flagging about 600 things at a time, at least per robo network, for, for the bots to do. And so that meant, as I was flying around in this area, my, um, because this is under a RoboPort system, the bots weren't the bots weren't coming out from the base to to upgrade it because they didn't have any purple belts. But then my bots weren't upgrading it because they didn't know which of the particular th I didn't know which of the particular things were being um, flagged for upgrade. So I'd fly I'd be hovering here and there'd be a load of blue belts underneath me, but none of it would be getting upgraded because the game had decided that the 600 things it wanted to concentrate on were all over here. I eventually sort of got round that by chucking a, a large number of purple belts into the um, in, into a blue no into a yellow chest around here somewhere and then allowing the uh, the base bots to go out and just you know do their jobs. And that helped quite a lot. But it was a little bit annoying when I was just clearly flying over belts that needed to be upgraded and the bots weren't doing anything. So, you know, that's something to be aware of. If you're trying to do if you're trying to do a massive upgrade from your inventory with your personal bots, but you also have a, a main planetary robocall system covering the same area, you might have some issues and you might need to enlist the planetary bots to help you out with it. While I was out here, I realised the old nuclear power plant that used to be oh, used, to, used to be over here somewhere was now completely superfluous. There's no point in having it because we weren't using nuclear power. We're getting all our power from solar, and that's working much better. So I ripped all of that out to try and save a little bit on UPS. I don't know how effective that's going to be. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. But there's quite a lot of fluid stuff in there, so I've pulled all of that out. I did leave a little bit down here at the bottom because I didn't want to pull these up because it hurts when you're carrying uranium around because of the radiation, so it burns a bit. Um, but maybe, maybe I should have tidied this up. And we do have a bit of an unnecessary belt running all the way up here, so perhaps I'll get rid of that as well. It just feeds into the disposal system up here. I also tied, jump, dumped a load of miscellaneous junk into the disposal system, so a lot of the buildings that we don't need anymore, a lot of resources and things that were in the warehouses up here. And so a lot of that is now being shipped back over to Norvis, where it can be uh, it can be recycled and reprocessed and re repurposed, or maybe just thrown away, but, I don't, but at least it's gone from the planet over here, so I don't have to worry about it. While I was here, I also pulled up the coronal mass ejection protection system that was in here. That is now up in space just over here, so that'll hopefully protect against any uh, CMEs that come in. We have a headroom of mm, only about 2 gigawatts. I can't remember how much power a coronal mass ejection is. Okay, well the next one is going for Talos and has an energy requirement of 1.4 gigawatts peak power. So I think this is going to be easily enough. However, I was talking, talking earlier about how Talos is a bit short of power, so might need to go out there and do a little bit of upgrading, I suspect. <laughs> but over here, I think Ignair is going to be absolutely fine. Oh. And the junk disposal system has completely broken over here, so it's supposed to monitor everything that's going into the system and make sure it then doesn't feed it back out again on the other side. I don't know why that's not working. The most likely reason is because I've come in and I've modified the system a little bit, but there should be a combinator over here that's counting everything that's ever been put into the spaceship. Yeah, here, here. And for some reason, it's not counted all of the junk things I was trying to dispose of. So this is the sort of junk I was trying to get rid of. You can, you can see it all up here. We've got some cables, we've got some wood, we've got some solar panels. And for some reason it's all just been passed out the other side. And I don't know what's going on there, but that is going to be an enormous pain to clear up. Um, yeah, that's, that's quite annoying. 
There's, I'll have to have a look at that in a bit more detail in the next stream and work out why we've got all the junk being passed straight back out again. Because um, that's not supposed to happen. The next thing I want to cover is some of Tristan's efforts in the uh, in the last stream to just keep things running nicely. And so, of course, that's going to involve trains. Uh, he's he's boosted some of the uh, beryllium trains. So presumably this one over here has now got, yes, it's got all the stuff in over here to make it run much, much faster and much more excitingly and much more effectively. So this will take this will now run much quicker as it takes the beryllium from here over to the intermediates production area, just to make sure we don't have any, any shortages over there. I guess having a few slow trains on the system is also going to cause problems because it's going to get in the way of the faster trains, which is why Tristan is working on gradually upgrading every single train on the entire planet to be the, the, the boosted version, meaning they'll all run around a little bit more quickly. Last week I talked about how we're having some problems with the uh, heat shielding tiles, and these are the ones that are being built over here, in theory, and you can see here exactly what the problem is. We, e ma using, making these with the old recipe uses an enormous quantity of sulphur, you use eight for every single tile, and that means the, 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 the uh, whole planet is struggling to produce the sulphur fast enough, and not only struggling to produce it fast enough, also struggling to bring it over here fast enough in order for this to keep up. And so we've moved on from this one, we now, we, we've noticed that there is the better recipe here, the alternative recipe, which only uses one sulphur, in fact it only uses half a sulphur per heat shielding tile, because you make two of them each time. And so that's, that is a much, much better recipe. The only downside of it is it uses iridium and we may have a little bit of a shortage of it. And so, in order to make mo the most of that, Tristan has produced this facility over here, which is making heat shield tiles with the uh, with the new recipe. So over here, we can see you can see we've had many many upgrades here. We're using faster belts. We're using the tier four machines instead of the tier three machines. We're using a speed beacon, a wide area beacon with Mark six modules in it. We're using tier six productivity modules, at least until we ran out of them. And as soon as we can get some more down here, we'll be using a few more of those. And we've got the iridium being passed through. Well, this warehouse is empty, but there is some on the belt still. So that's been brought over here, chopped up into the plates and stone bricks also being chopped up into plates being passed around through all these machines and then we can make them quite a lot quicker and that's pouring a nice steady stream of heat shield tiles out over here and as you can see we've got a pretty full warehouse over here I suspect a train has arrived relatively recently and so we're now we're just topping that up and so this has made a big difference as you can see if we look at the graph over here. So previously we were producing them at about a rate of about a thousand per minute probably with this wibbling up and down probably being as each time, each time the sulphur ran out. Then there was a big upgrade and we're now able to produce them at about yeah, eight thousand per minute although it's fallen off a little bit here. What if, why, why have we got a shortage? I'm, I'm not sure why because all these machines seem to be running very happily. I don't know why it's dropped off a bit here, but it does seem to have done. Uh, that said, this four and a half thousand also I think is going to be absolutely fine. We've got enough pouring out over here that we've got, that we, that's just get, should be able to keep the factory happy. And looking at the numbers here, you can see, well, over the last uh, hour, we've produced 2.2 thousand per minute and we've used 1.6 thousand per minute. In the last 10 minutes, it's even better, producing it at three times the rate we're using them up at. So I'm pretty sure everything is going to be absolutely fine here. Most of these are probably going into making all the scaffolding that's required for our massive solar outposts, I suspect. So yes, I did talk a little bit last week about how I expected Mark was going to build the system, um, but unfortunately he wasn't able to join us for the last stream, so Tristan jumped in instead and, uh, and threw it together quite quickly. And once again, I've mentioned this before, but it's got the usual thing of where the uh, the rail system that you have to build up in order to get your uh, your inputs and outputs for the uh, for the build is actually bigger than the system that's building the stuff itself. So uh, it looks pretty crazy like this, but you know it works. It, I'm not going to knock it. It's what we need. The interesting thing about this is that Tristan has left the old uh, production facility up here also running. So eventually, this will f this will fill up over here, and we'll have a we'll have a warehouse full. And at that point, the whole system will go to sleep. And the reason he's left there is because we aren't a hundred percent confident on the supply of iridium, and so we we want to have the uh, old backup facility available in case there's a crisis. Uh, and so down here, this you'll notice that this the new facility down here is much closer to everything that's going to be using them, which is mostly going to be a bus drop-off station somewhere around here uh, than the station up here. And that means that the trains will prioritise bringing them from here down to here rather than going up here to get them. And so that means we'll use these ones by preference, but if we run out because we've got a shortage of iridium or just because the system isn't fast enough, we will then also be able to pull them from the old system up here and make sure we've always got a supply available. In order to keep everything running nicely from there, Tristan's upgraded the sulphur production in the small oil area. So down here, um, it looks like he's probably done it through sort of massive implementation of, um, of, of, of uh, modules. So here we've got a wide area beacon too with a load of tier 6 speed modules in it, making these machines run astonishingly quickly. Um, so the sulphur that comes out of here is required both for making sulfuric acid and for loading up the sulphur trains. You can see there's, we've got two stations here to load them because there's such high demand on sulphur, mostly down to the heat shield tile production. So hopefully, once we fill up the warehouse in the top area, 
this will calm down a bit and we won't need quite so much. Now the interesting thing you'll note about this is that the sulfur production is currently, well it's running really really quickly, uh, but it is limited by the amount of water that can be brought in I think. So these, these water ducts here are empty. And if we follow them back to the to their water source, uh, it comes sort of somewhere up here, uh, down, down here, up this pipe over here, and we can see that over here we've got we've got many many pumps. We've got six pumps feeding into a duct intake, and it seems that that's not enough. This duct is not very full. So what I think we're going to need to do is put in at least two more of these sort of modules systems, and have them feed in over maybe into this one over here, this duct over here, and um, and pass, so we can pass more of it down here, down into the processing facility down. Down here and hopefully then be able to speed up the uh, production of the sulfur. It's pretty quick as it is but you can see we've got the yellow lights on here so it could be a lot quicker. This train is, um, okay the train is full, it appears to be enough right now uh, but when I looked at it earlier when I was making some plans it was not, the, uh, the train was not, the, the sulfur was not being produced quickly enough to fill the train up as, as fast as I would like it to. So a little bit of expansion is going to be required here I think, um, specifically on the, on the water input for, the, uh, for this system. And I think the ducts are well capable of passing that much liquid through we just need to make sure we're able to pass enough into them in order to keep them happy. Up in Norbit, Tristan has been continuing making improvements up here as well, and we had a we had a train jam up here for some slightly odd reasons. So at the moment, we have this area over here that is making a particle st particle stream in large reasonable quantities, but this is quite an expensive recipe. In order to make it, you need to, you end up using up material testing back, a lot of sand, and quite a bit of plasma stream. And making that plasma stream requires a load of stuff as well. So that requires a load of lithium and a load of chemical gel. And that, that adds up. That's fairly expensive. And so a couple of months ago, or maybe a little bit longer, I don't know, I have no concept of time, I put together this system over here that makes particle stream from a different recipe. And these machines will take in uh, stone matter liberation data and particle stream, and they'll make a bit more particle stream, and occasionally Occasionally they'll use up a little bit of the matter liberation data, and they use up the stone as well, but stone is cheap. We have huge amounts of that coming in, in from Andragon. And so we reckon that this recipe is actually a lot cheaper, which is bizarre, You given my usual opinions on anything that uses data cards or anything, but this one actually is, be is significantly better. So we're making lots and lots of uh, particle stream over here, which is being fed up to a station along over here somewhere, and then taken away by train to wherever it's needed. So like we've done with heat shield tiles, we've kept the old system over here and we've, we've set up a, we set up a prioritization system to make sure we wouldn't be pulling from this one unless this one over here was fairly empty. And we're doing that by monitoring the amount of particle stream that's in the, in the station over there by using this red, cunning red cable. So we can see at the moment there's 399,000 and that means over here we're watching, um, we're watching this and we're seeing, it's saying if there's less than 80,000 then we'll turn the station on. There is not less than 80,000, there is currently 399,000 so we won't turn the station on. Unfortunately, using enable disable like this means that if they uh, if there's a shortage over here and and then then we have an, and then um, in the time it takes for the train to get from there to go into this station over here and get ready to start filling up. If during that time this station fills back up again, so we have more than 399,000, then this station will be deactivated potentially when there's a train on its way to it, and that led to a train getting confused and stopping and causing a train jam, and that's not what we want. And so in order to sort that, Tristan came up with quite an elegant solution. Uh, if I can find the station, here we go. So down here, we now we are now also monitoring the number of trains that are the train count for the station, and the train count is the number of trains in the station and the number of trains going to the station. So it uses the same count, essentially the same count as the train limit count over here, and he's outputting that as a C. And then over here with this combinator, we're multiplying C by uh, minus a hundred thousand and outputting that as a particle stream signal. And so that means if there are any trains on their way over here, then we're going to to subtract a huge negative number from the uh, from the amount of uh, particle stream we're, we think there is on the network and feed it into the station. And so the station then won't disable itself, at least until the train has left. And so that should, in theory, ensure that the train can come in, it can pick up a particle stream from here and go off to wherever it's needed without throwing off all the rest of the control systems we've got over here. So if we if we are low over here, then it suggests there's a bit of a problem. We, we might want to take a train's worth away from over here, and we certainly don't want to just cause a train jam from it. So I think that's quite a neat system. I'm, um, I'm very impressed with it. it, and, it um, and well, we'll, just, we'll, we'll wait and see to see if it works, but I'm fairly confident that it will. Right, I think that's quite a good time to uh, stop the video. We've, we've talked about a number of different uh, quite interesting things that have been going on around the factory, and, uh, and so we'll uh, 
Come back tomorrow to have a look into, well, we'll find out why the science is a bit sad at the moment and why we're, so why we're not using up any Naquium. And we'll have a bit of a look into how Mike has been breaking various spaceship related things, <laughs> as is his way. <clears throat> so I hope you'll come back and join me. Those will be the videos coming out tomorrow and on Sunday. As usual, I've had quite a lot to say, so it's going to be a three video weekend. We will then be back on Monday, as ever, with the, uh, with the next uh, K2SE stream, where we'll be fixing some of the problems we've been finding here and trying to get the science up and running nicely, because at the moment, it's a little bit problematic. And then on Wednesday, I'm afraid there won't be a satisfactory stream this week because I'm, it's another show week. Now, I'm going to be around for the Monday stream, but I'm taking the rest of the week off because I'm not in, I'm not in the show, but I am doing backstage for it. So I'm not, basically, I'm not going to be around very much next week. So the uh, satisfactory stream is cancelled, but we should still have, as I say, we'll still have the, uh, the normal Monday stream and we'll still have the videos at the end of the week as well, as usual. Uh, and then the week after, we'll go back to normal. So still more uh, Factorio streams and the satisfactory stream as well. So it's going to be a little bit of a hiatus on the Wednesday night streams. But I hope you'll uh, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any of that and you'll see everything when it kicks back into normal gear again. But I hope I'll see you for all the Factorio content and then back for Satisfactory the week after. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.